Neville Goddard, November 11th, 1968. Follow Me, read by Josiah Brandt. We are told that when Jesus found Philip, he said, Follow me. Then Philip told Nathanael, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote. Philip is one who is interested in the workings of the mind. Looking for one who is searching for the source of the phenomena of life, Jesus finds one in whom he can reveal himself. The book of John begins, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, turning into a person, it is said, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the consciousness of men. Read this statement carefully and not superficially, and you will discover that from the beginningless beginning there has been God and another through whom God acts and by whom God expresses himself. One who is to God what man's imagination is to man. They are inseparable, for the word is not only with God, but is God. Man finds it difficult to identify himself with his imagination, but the word logos, translated word, means a purpose, a plan, a pattern. The word which was with God in the beginning is divine imagination, through which all things are made. There is not one thing in the world today which was not first imagined. Perhaps you cannot grasp the idea that nature was first imagined, but you cannot deny that man's clothing, home, business, and transportation were imagined. Man expresses himself through his human imagination just as God expresses himself through his divine imagination. There is no clear-cut separation between God and imagination or man and his imagination. I tell you, imagination is God himself. He is the divine body, Jesus, of which we are his members. Identifying divine imagination with Jesus, Blake claims imagination became man, that man may become God's power and wisdom called Christ. Any Christ other than he who is crucified, buried, and rises in an individual is false, for there is no Christ other than man's own wonderful human imagination. God's creative power is buried in you. Just as a seed buried in the womb of woman must bring forth after its own kind, God's power is brought forth as your spiritual birth. Your imagination is spirit buried in you. God, being spirit, has planted his seed, which will erupt one day and you will experience a spiritual birth.
again. God's creative power is buried in you. Just as a seed buried in a womb of a woman must bring forth after its own kind, God's power is brought forth as your spiritual birth. Your imagination is spirit buried in you. God, being spirit, has planted his seed, which will erupt one day and you will experience a spiritual birth. In the third chapter of the Gospel of John, he speaks to one who is a member of the Sanhedrin, saying, Unless a man is born from above, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because it is impossible to physically enter that which is spirit. The kingdom of heaven, being spirit, can only be entered through a spiritual experience. Nicodemus, accepting this statement on a physical level, asked, How can a man who is old re-enter his mother's womb and be born again? His question was answered in this strange way. The wind blows where it will, and you hear the sound thereof, but you cannot tell from whence it comes or whither it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. When I was born from above, I was aware of a peculiar, unearthly wind. This wind is a must in order for man to leave this sphere of death and enter the eternal sphere of life called the kingdom of heaven. One cannot speculate upon God's kingdom by using images of earth, for eyes have not seen or ears heard what God has prepared for those who love him. If your eyes have not seen or your ears heard of that age, don't try to speculate using images of earth, for there is nothing here that remotely resembles the kingdom. Now, let me share my experiences with you. I retired one night, never suspecting that the time of delivery was upon me. I had been carrying God's plan of salvation within me since the beginning of time. It had been growing, yet I did not suspect its birth. That night, as I slept, I felt an unearthly vibration possess me. It increased in intensity until I felt I must explode, when suddenly I began to awake. Expecting to see the room I had fallen asleep in, and the normal awareness I have known after a dream of the night, I awoke to a greater awareness to discover I was in my skull, which was a tomb in which I was buried. Alone, I arose to discover my skull was sealed and there was no escape. I knew I had awakened in my head, yet all of the outlets through the eyes, ears, and mouth were sealed. Intuitively, I knew that if I pushed the base of my skull, I would be set free. I did, and as something moved, I squeezed myself through that little opening, just as a child comes out of the womb of a woman. When I was completely free, I looked back at the head from which I had come. 
It was ghastly pale, turning from side to side as though recovering from a great ordeal. I had no idea I had been sleeping in that head, but thought it was my very being. It had never occurred to me that the spirit which gave me life was the cause of my breathing and consciousness. I thought my physical body was me, not realizing it was simply where the real me was buried. Once out of my skull, an unearthly wind caused my head, as well as the house, to rattle. Looking for the cause, my attention was diverted for a few seconds. And when I looked back, my body was gone, and in its place were my three brothers. One was sitting where the head had been, while the other two were sitting at the feet. Disturbed by the sound, one rose and moved in the direction of the wind. Looking down, he said, Why, it's Neville's baby. The other two questioned his words, saying, How can Neville have a baby? Without arguing the point, my brother reached down, picked up a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, and placed it on the bed. Then I as though having rehearsed the drama in eternity, took the babe in my arms and said, How is my sweetheart? As the child broke into a heavenly smile. Then the scene dissolved and I awoke. We are told that each individual is born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I, an individual, have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote. For when I awoke in that tomb, no one else was there. I recognized that tomb to be my skull, and when I came out from its base, I found the sign of my spiritual birth as a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying on the floor. The word translated manger means floor, the lowest point in the area. So you see, a child is not born. The child is only a sign of your individual spiritual birth. It was I who rose in the sepulchre and pushed myself out. It was I who was born anew through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. After this experience, all of my concepts of Jesus Christ crumbled and dissolved, for I knew that the very being who I was in the beginning with God actually became me that I may become God in the most literal sense. I knew that God was not only crucified upon me, but was buried within me. That I carried in my body the death of Jesus, that his life may be made alive in me. Again, after this experience, all of my concepts of Jesus Christ crumbled and dissolved, for I knew that the being who was in the beginning with God actually became me, that I may become God in the most literal sense. 
I knew that God was not only crucified upon me, but was buried within me. That I carried in my body the death of Jesus, that his life might be made alive in me. I was awed at this experience. Knowing all of the things I had done and was still capable of doing, I wondered how I could be the Christ of Scripture. Yet I have searched Scripture and cannot find any other explanation. I now share with you what I have experienced. For everything recorded there as an event in the life of the one called Jesus Christ has unfolded in me. We are told, you search the scriptures, thinking in them you will find eternal life. Yet it is they which bear witness to me. 139 days after my resurrection and birth from above, my head began to vibrate intensely. Suddenly, it burst, and I found myself seated in a modestly furnished room. A youth, handsome beyond measure, was leaning against the frame of an open door. As I looked at him, I knew he was my son, yet I also knew he was David of biblical fame. At that moment, I had found my son, and he had found his father. The next morning, as I searched scripture to find out who saw David and whom David called father, this is what I found. In the 89th Psalm, the Lord declared, I have found David. He has cried unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. If David called the Lord his Father, and David called me Father, am I not the Lord? This is the plan that God established in the beginning when he gave himself to you and me. Being a father before the pledge, when God succeeds in the giving, you and I must be God. Dwell upon these words. I am the true and living way to the Father. No one comes unto the Father save by me. This true and living way is a pattern, buried in all, which leads the individual to the discovery of being God the Father. This truth is revealed by David, for it is he who says, I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said unto me, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. Now, Christ, being God's creative power and wisdom, cannot be separated from God. Christ was not some little boy who was born 2,000 years ago, but God's semen, his creative power that is buried in humanity. The image of God is contained within that semen. And if God is a father, when the semen awakens in the individual, he will know himself to be God, the father of all life.
123 days after the revelation of being God the Father, I fulfilled the third chapter of John, wherein Nicodemus was told, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That which is recorded in the book of Numbers is an adumbration of the event. For when the Son of Man is lifted up, it is an extremely personal experience. That night, a bolt of lightning split my body from the top of my head to the base of my spine, becoming a pool of golden liquid light. Knowing it was myself, I knew I was self-redeemed. I fused with the light and, becoming one with it, I ascended my spine to enter my skull, where the drama began. As I did, my skull reverberated from the intensity of the vibration. And once again, scripture was fulfilled. There is no other purpose in life other than to fulfill scripture. You may own all of Caesar's belongings, but when you depart this world, you must leave it all behind. But when God's pattern erupts in you, you enter an eternal world, knowing yourself to be its creative power. Then you are used to express God in any aspect your very being so desires. Again, there is no other purpose in life other than to fulfill scripture. You may own all of Caesar's belongings, but when you depart this world, you must leave it all behind. But when God's pattern erupts in you, you enter an eternal world, knowing yourself to be its creative power. Then you are used to express God in any aspect your very being so desires. The fourth and final revelation occurs 998 days later. This event brings the total number of days from the birth from above to the discovery of the dove to 1,210, as foretold in the books of Daniel and Revelation. On this final day, my skull became transparent as a lovely beige dove floated about 20 feet above me. As I raised my right hand, the dove descended and lit upon my index finger. Then I brought it to my face, and it smothered me with affection. Here again, Scripture was fulfilled as the Holy Spirit descended upon me in bodily form as a dove revealing the story of Jesus Christ as a personal experience. When I was physically born, it was through the action of powers not my own, and I had no consciousness of it. But my spiritual birth was consciously experienced from beginning to end.
This is my story. It is my hope that you will follow me. That you will believe my experiences. If I tell you earthly things and you do not believe me, how can I expect you to believe the heavenly things I share with you? Everyone imagines. Can you believe that Christ, imagination's power, is in you? If so, then God is in you. And if God is in you, you cannot be lost, for then God would be lost. Everyone has to be redeemed. Everyone will be saved because God, the Savior of each individual, is redeeming himself, bringing the individual awareness in whom he is buried back into the kingdom with him. The moment God buried himself in you, he imprinted himself upon you, predestining you to not only radiate and reflect God's glory, but to be the express image of his person. God is not some impersonal force, but a person. The unknown author of the letters to the Hebrews claimed he was the express image of God's person. This is a true statement. Not one will be lost because all of us will be gathered together into that one body, one spirit, one Lord, one God, and Father of all. In the end, there will be one grand fulfillment of the greatest of all commandments. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. When I speak of my imagination, there appears to be two of us, Neville and my imagination. I know my imagination cannot be seen, yet I also know I cannot separate myself from it. If I lose myself in a daydream and move from my living room in Beverly Hills to Central Park in New York City, I have not separated myself from my creative power. I cannot, for my imagination is my very being. I can speak of my imagination, but I cannot separate myself from it any more than God can be separated from divine imagination. For through divine imagination's creativity, God creates and sustains the world. Should God change his imagining, the world would cease to exist, because it must be and is supported by an imaginal act. The same thing is true in your world. It will change only when you cease to continue to dwell in your current imaginal state. But there is a pattern buried in you that will not change. Told in the form of a story, man thinks an individual was born 2,000 years ago. But the creative power of God did not assume only one man. He took human nature into his sacred self. The one creative power of the universe is buried in humanity. It is the same creative power in one who murders, as in the one who is murdered. God allows you to misuse Christ, his creative power. But, in the end, 
he will awaken, and all violence within you will cease to be, for you will discover yourself to be infinite love, infinite wisdom, and infinite power. Then the world will become a shadow, and you will know there is no need to fight shadows. Now, let me share two experiences of one who knows herself to be an incurrent eyewitness. She has the capacity to turn her thoughts inward and see a world as solid and real as our outer one appears to be. This particular day, she decided to leave the scene that was before her eyes by turning inward and claiming it had vanished. But instead of vanishing, the scene froze and everything became a cold, dead statue. Realizing that she had the power to arrest it, she decided to test herself to see if she could reanimate the scene once more. So, she imagined the scene was alive, and instantly life flowed through the room, as though no action on her part had ever stopped its flow. Then she said to herself, If I can stop and start what the world calls vision, I should be able to stop and start what the world calls reality. She can, for in that brief vision, she learned where life really is. Christ in her gave her a taste of the power she will exercise consciously in the not distant future. Although this world appears so very real, it is a vision. All that you behold, though it appears without, it is within. In your imagination, of which this world of mortality is but a shadow. If life is in God, and God is your imagination, then what the world calls life is only an activity of your imagination. If you stop imagining and arrest that which seems to be animated and independent of your perception, you will prove to yourself that it can be done. Then you will know who Christ is, for you will have discovered that in him is life, and his life is the light of men. God animates man within himself. Although humanity appears to be independent with life in themselves, their life is but an activity of imagination. For that is what I am. My friend also shared this experience. One night in dream, she was in a classroom listening to a woman teach the law. Claiming to believe and practice the law, the woman began to rant and rave against Neville, claiming he was insane as she did not believe in the promise. The lady then asked the teacher, do you believe that imagining creates reality? And when the woman replied, yes, the lady asked, how would you feel right now if you began to imagine you were God? With that, the teacher screamed, you should be in the same institution with Neville.
It is easy to mouth the words, imagining creates reality. But are you willing to imagine you are God? And if you did, would you become God? At that thought, a line was drawn. So she does not really believe that imagining creates reality. She is willing to believe that she can imagine things are better than they seem, but to believe she is God is an insane thought. Her dream fulfilled the 10th chapter of John, where the question is asked, Why listen to him? The man is mad and has a demon. When one comes to tell the story of God becoming man, that man may become God, he is called mad, because his words are in conflict with what the world believes. This is always true. If anyone told our forefathers that electricity was a fact, that by merely turning a switch a room would be ablaze with light, he would have been called crazy and condemned. In certain sections of time, if a thought was in conflict with what the churches taught, one could be burned at the stake. Every man who awakens to his infinite power is considered mad. His words are considered those of the devil, for his experiences do not conform to what men think Christ is. Men are looking for some super being to come out of the clouds and save the people who are now dead and treat the others horribly. But if someone comes and claims there is only one Savior and that one is in everyone as his awareness, one is considered mad and possessed by the devil. But I tell you, God acts the moment you imagine. You are the temple of the living God and the Spirit of God dwells in you. In the 10th chapter of Hebrews, this temple is identified with the curtain, which, when torn from top to bottom, opens up the new and living way. Then, ascending in consciousness, you take your own blood into the presence of the living God. Paul asks the question, Do you know you are the temple of the living God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you? 1 Corinthians 3.16 If the curtain of that temple is torn from top to bottom, it has to be you. The Spirit who ascends is He who is buried in you and will rise in the same manner as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. So, when I ask you to follow me, I mean it literally, for I am telling you what I know from experience. I am not theorizing or speculating. Redemption is a very personal experience that takes place in the individual you. No one really dies, for the world does not cease to exist when your senses cease to register it. Your friends and loved ones who have departed this world are just as real to themselves as when they were here. Now, clothed in bodies like yours and mine, 
they are in a terrestrial world fulfilling their unfulfilled desires. While there, they will know the same struggles, joy and sorrow, peace and war, as Christ continues to awaken God's image in them. When God said, let us make man in our image, he placed that image in you. And when Christ is born in you, you, the express image of the invisible God, enter the kingdom, radiating and reflecting God's glory. There are those who believe they are reborn by changing their attitude and giving more money to the church. That is because they do not know the mystery of Christ. My visions would frighten them, and they would call me mad. Yet I am telling the truth, which I know from experience. I am not trying to share some workable philosophy of life. Another lady wrote, telling of a dream in which she found herself standing in a long line, moving towards a man sitting behind a desk. When she arrived, he stamped the back of her left hand with indelible ink, and she intuitively knew this was her entrance into heaven. A few nights later, she found herself on a highway protected by chains. Seeing two secondary roads leading off the highway, she knew she had formerly walked there, but was now on the roads towards the kingdom of heaven. These dreams are foreshadowings, healthy experiences to encourage her to persist. She has now found the one and only way to the Father. That way is, I am. Believing in the Father, she will find him. And when she does, she will find her very self. We are told that God speaks to man through the medium of dream and makes himself known in vision. If this is true, no voice should interest you more than that which is heard in your dreams and visions. Words spoken by men of the world are spoken from theory. They voice their opinions, but I am telling you my revelations. This night, I have told you how Christ is formed. As Paul said, My little children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ be formed in you. Just like a child is being formed in the womb of a woman, when Christ is formed in you, it comes forth. Then you awaken to discover you have been sound asleep throughout the centuries, although you did not know it. The world, seeing a mortal body cremated and turned to dust, cannot understand how there can be a head that survives such an experience. But it does, for the real man is all imagination. He imagines a body there just as easily as he imagines one here. When you see a friend or dear one who has departed, you will recognize him. But he will be young, as he is continuing the work that he set out to do, which is to form Christ in him.
one of the signs of your spiritual birth will be the three witnesses. As I stood watching them, their thoughts were objective to me. I was unseen by them because spirit was born. As spirit, I was invisible to my mortal brothers who came to witness the event. Unless one is born into the spirit world, when he leaves this world of flesh and blood, he is not spirit, but solidly real, as we are here. He is not seen by mortal eye, because a veil has been drawn. But, after your spirit is born, the veil is removed from your spiritual eyes, and you will realize humanity is doing what must be done in order for God's image to be formed in them. Again, unless one is born into the spirit world, when he leaves this world of flesh and blood, he is not spirit, but solidly real, as we are here. He is not seen by mortal eye, because a veil has been drawn. But... After your spirit is born, the veil is removed from your spiritual eyes, and you will realize humanity is doing what must be done in order for God's image to be formed in them. Every man's words are his judge. Believe me, and follow me into an entirely different sphere known as the kingdom of God. Now, let us go into the silence. 